today, we extend a warm welcome to Pastor Terry Swenson and his wife Marion, who've travelled all the way from Loma Linda in California uh, to spend the weekend with us. Um, thank you so much for travelling so far to the most isolated state capital in the world. You're very welcome. <laughs> a couple of announcements for you. Um, we also welcome, uh, there's quite a few visitors here today, um, and in my line of vision over here, I have Peo, who is from Botswana originally, and um, she's actually come here to study at Curtin Uni, which means good things, as we know. Um, so Peo arrived, I think, on Thursday this week, and uh, thanks to the advantages of technology, she contacted us through Facebook, and she's here today. It seems to be the season that German people are travelling. I don't know why that is, but we welcome that, because we're benefiting. Um, so... I met Jenny this morning. Jenny, where are you? Stand up. And with her is, Lo is Lorenzo from Italy, if you could also stand up. Um, and you might have met a couple of weeks ago a young lady called um, Eugenia, who's also from Germany, and it turns out she and Jenny go to the same church. So uh, bad luck to that church, but um, we're very glad that you're here, and please do make yourself at home. Um, birthdays, 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 always a good thing. Uh, Dr. Natalie Laytow, happy birthday for tomorrow. <laughs> Sitting down the front here. And also Jake Meredith. Yeah, Jake, happy 15th for Monday. <laughs> um, also importantly, uh, please remember that next week is a regional Sabbath, uh, what that means is that this church will be closed for both Sabbath school and church. And instead, everyone from around Perth is invited to um, gather at Curtin University, uh, where we'll be uh, worshipping together and hearing from uh, Dillis Brooks, who, believe it or not, must be the travel season in California as well. Dillis is also um, a chaplain at Loma Linda University, and she'll be the speaker next weekend. Um, highly recommended. She's a good lady. She's very hard-hitting when she speaks, and sometimes you feel like she has prepared her message and it is just penetrating your heart. So don't stay at home next week. Uh, that's far too boring. Come out to Regional Sabbath at Curtin University with Dillis Brooks. Um, also, there's going to be a mass choir uh, preparing an item for the regional meeting. If you like to sing, that's a good thing. Sometimes it's better done in a group. Mass choir is for you. Um, if you would, it's not too late to join in the mass choir. Um, I'm told that they are rehearsing on Friday at 6.30 p.m. at the Curtin University Stadium. Mass choir. Give it a go. You won't regret it. And also the rest of this weekend, um, please remember that we have a program today at 2 p.m., we hope you brought your lunch, that you can stay. Um, and also, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., we will be having the final Follow Him session for this weekend. Good morning, everyone. It's come to that time where I get to invite Terry up. Yes, please. We are going to do what I am labelling a serious sandwich, in that I'm going to start with a couple of serious questions. We're then going to do a fast quick fire of not so serious questions and we're going to finish on a serious question. So uh, I've just dubbed that serious sandwich. Feel free to use it as, as you wish. <laughs> Terry, you are a, a chaplain at Loma Linda. Can you share with us uh, some of the courses that you can do at Loma Linda and why you would recommend to come to your university? Okay, Loma Linda. This is good, they'll like this. Loma Linda is a major health science university. So we have eight schools, pharmacy, nursing, dentistry, uh, medicine of course, um, allied health, public health, did I say pharmacy? Yep. And we have a school of religion where you can uh, get advanced degrees. Mm. Good, and why Did should we come there? Well, because I'm there. Come, we can. Yeah. We can. No, <laughs> he's there. it is a wonderful place. If you've ever wanted to travel the globe, if you come there, you will. Because yeah. we have people from over, um, let's see, how many is it now? 300 different countries. 
and you'll meet people that you'll go around the world and rub shoulders with them. You'll learn a global outreach as well as a local outreach and how to live your walk with Jesus through your healthcare profession. Mm -hmm. I've looked up jobs there actually and it's an uh, internationally renowned uh, medical centre. So it's a good one. Well, if you want to come, let me know. We uh, maybe I'll, we'll okay. talk about that later. Um, so <laughs> another serious question. Yes. Uh, you call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist. What is something that you're proud of, of this faith? Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of things I'm proud of, mm. of this faith. Um, as I mentioned last night, I teach a course, Adventist Belief and Lifestyle. Mm. And in my classroom, I will have Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim. Mm. Not, many, not many Adventist pastors get to teach like that. Yeah. And the thing that I'm proudest of is what we believe is whole and it holds together. Mm -hmm. It follows the word of God mm -hmm. and people see it. Good. I love it. So that's the first piece of bread. I'm going to get <laughs> okay. Ryan, if you don't mind, putting up the die on the back. Okay, I should get uh, out of the way. Yeah, we can step aside a little there bit. There we go. We are going to generate for two numbers. The first number is the number of words that I can use in my question for you. Mm -hmm. And the second number is the number of words that you can use in your answer. All right. Yeah, so this is just as hard for me as it is for you. <laughs> uh, so first number, Ryan, if you give it a click, let's see what I have to... Two, all right. Um, and then I've got to ask a question with two words. Roll again. And you've got to answer it with three words. Oh. Okay? Okay. You ready for this improv? <laughs> okay. Okay, so Terry, favourite food? Favourite food. Lamingtons. 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 <laughs> First thing off the top of his head. Uh, Alright, I'm going to think of another woo. question. Um, with two... Oh, well, you get four. Oh, so my question now is with four, que uh, four words, and your answer is with six. Yes! Alright, here we go. <laughs> Wait, that might be bad. Rainy days or sunshine? I like rainy days the best. Good work. Very good. I agree Woo. with you. I agree. So today's a good, a good day for you. Yes. All right, next. I'm using two words again, and you're answering with... Hey, hey okay. That's good. They want to hear more of you than me. Uh, any pets? This is hard to get the right number. <laughs> yes, I have... A Chihuahua honey. I'm assuming honey is the name of the Chihuahua. Yeah, no, yeah, I oh, wasn't calling the you honey. No, no, okay, the, sure. dog, <laughs> the dog's name is Honey. Just to clarify, just honey to clarify. the Chihuahua. Sure. Yes. Yes. All right, let's do two more. What's um, what do I have to ask? Oh, I've got one word, and you've got to answer with four words. Oh. Okay. Okay. Reading. Uh, reading. Um, that's too many. Yes, I like reading. <laughs> <laughs> you could have gone any direction. Yeah, I that would, wasn't you know, a good one. Maybe but, if yeah. you want to know what he's reading at the moment, you can ask him over lunch afterwards. All right, last one. How many, how many words do I have? I've got three, and you've got... Five. Five. Okay. Right, yeah, yeah. Let's see what I can do. Um, favorite Bible character? Oh. In five I like words. a bunch of them. Um, Old Testament and New Testament. <laughs> All encompassing. All of them. All encompassing. There you go. There Very you good. go. Okay. The second, um, the last part of our sandwich, the last piece of bread, I've got another serious question for you. It's so serious that we ask every speaker that comes to follow him, and that is, how did you propose to your wife? The wrong way. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, we were, <laughs> it was in her sister's garage. How's that for romance? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were refinishing an antique, uh, what do you call, uh, 
we call it a dresser. What do you call it? The big thing dresser, with drawers. Dressing table, yeah. No, not no, dressing, dressing table. table. Bureau? Bu chest of drawers? Chest of drawers, yeah. The big thing with drawers, you put clothes in. All right, mm -hmm. And it was an antique one, and we, we had all of the... We had all of the drawers out, and we were sanding, and we were working away. And uh, something happened. I can't remember why, but we kind of fell over, and all the drawers fell over, and dust was flying everywhere. And her hair was kind of askew, and she had Ooh. dust on her face. And I looked at her, and she was so pretty, I asked her. Aww, so it was spontaneous. Now, it, it was all right, but really, if I could like go back in time, I would have done it much more romantic. Okay. I think she would have answered me better, too. Oh, what was the Because when I asked her, she said, I need to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> too much in the one moment. There Thanks you go. for sharing, Terry. I'm just going to pray for you, and then we Please. can get into it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Terry and, and uh, for Marion as well, that they could fly this way. I just ask a blessing on his uh, mouth and his heart and his head that he can share what you intend for us to hear. We love you, God, in your dear name. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was tough. Okay. Usually they say my, my degrees and what I've done and blah, blah, blah. I've written a book, you know, all that stuff. That, that was fun, though. I, I don't know if they did that because they liked me or they wanted to torture me. I'm not quite sure. In there. Um, I tried to look around as we traveled about in, um, in, in Perth here. But in your, in, behind your homes, in your yards, do you have walls or fences? Fence. Fence. Do you have fences? Okay. In Southern California, we have fences. We have walls. We, we, we divide our land and we protect it. It's not very much land, very small plots, but we believe in walls. And so when, when, I, when I was young, when I was young, and we went to seminary in uh, Michigan, Andrews University, and we rented a place to stay. I went into the backyard, and we had two children at that time, two little ones. Went into the backyard, and, and I was shocked to see the yards. None of them had walls. You could just walk right into people's backyards. And see, in Southern California, we get nervous about that. We, you know... Americans worry about things. We're very cautious people. We want to protect and wall and run into our houses. And, and so when I went there, I was shocked. I stood out there and looked, and I go, these people have no walls. What's wrong with them? How do you keep people out of your yard? Walls. We like walls. Human beings like walls. I want to share some famous walls with you in the world today. Hadrian's Wall in England. Anybody ever seen that? Hadrian's Wall was built in 122 AD by the Romans under Emperor Hadrian to protect their colony of Britannia from the tribes of Scotland. This stretches shore to shore at one point for 73 miles, 117 kilometers. Okay? Longest wall in Europe. Or how about the Great Wall of China? Has anybody ever been there to see that? That's one of my, you, you have? That's one of my bucket lists to see that. The Great Wall in China was built in the 14th century, once again to protect the northern borders of the Chinese Empire from attacks of nomadic tribes. It stretches for 7,242 kilometers in length. Wow. The Berlin Wall in Germany, that some of you might remember, or if you're younger, you studied about it, was built in 1961, and it was built by communist East Germany to separate from democratic West Germany, and it stood until it was torn down in 1989. And yes, the United States, unfortunately and sadly to me, has been busy building a border wall between the United States and Mexico, that stretches for over 580 miles, or 933 kilometers. And its purpose, to keep illegal aliens from entering the United States of America. Why do we have walls? Okay, it's going to be interactive time. I'm going to let you talk to me. Just when I ask you to, though, please. All right. Why do we have walls? What are some of the reasons for walls? Privacy. Privacy. What? Separate. What about? 
Keep things in. Fear, boundaries. Keep things out, okay? We keep out undesirables, whatever they are. People, animals, whatever, undesirable things. That's why we have our walls. Protect our property, our kingdoms. Establish the power of the builders over the people within the walls and without the walls. That's some of the reasons for walls. But what are the effects of walls? Walls control. That's what they're there for. Walls are to control. Walls are to define. Walls exclude. Walls are built because of fear. It's the only reason for walls. And walls imprison those inside. Let's take a moment and pray. So Heavenly Father, we're following Jesus this weekend. And we're understanding that it, his kingdom is a rather kingdom, a rather kingdom, a, a contrary, on the contrary kind of kingdom. And Lord, we talked about how you save. You don't come to judge. You come to save us, to heal us, to make us whole last night. And today, Lord, we're talking about walls. And that's a touchy subject. May we hear your voice. May we be led by your spirit. May we be changed by being in your presence today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's also walls that you might not think of. There's invisible walls all around us. In fact, and I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to say it, but this church in Perth is like all the other churches. There's walls in this very room. Okay? So, once again, your turn. What kind of walls do you see in this room? There's absolutely walls. Oh, there's walls, the invisible ones. What kind of walls might be in this room? Us and them. I'm very hurt by all the talk of, of gray and old hair and no hair last night. You know, young and old. Yeah, I, I wept last night. There's invisible walls around us. They're not walls made of stone and mortar or steel, but they're more powerful. And they're more daunting than the Hadrian's Wall or the, even the Great Wall of China. These walls are insidious. Because these walls are, at first glance, invisible, but at closer investigation, they stand tall and formidable. What walls am I referring to? We live in a world of racial walls. In the news in America, on and on is the issues between police, white policemen shooting African-American men and other walls that dice in many different ways. Racial walls, we look at each other and see differences. There's social walls, status walls. Don't you notice it? Have you ever done this? If you ever want to have a fun experiment sometime, and I, I do things like this. Yes, pray for my wife. She's lived with me all these years. I do things. Try going to a place and dress disheveled. Grubby, whatever, you know, just wrinkled clothes. Go, go to a fancy place, upscale place, and go in there and try to get a seat like in a, a, a very classic restaurant and see what they do to you. And then you can even go a, a couple hours later or maybe the next night, go back and be dressed to, we might say, to the nines. You know, your best clothes, your designer, like, like they dress in Melbourne. I learned Melbourne are the fashion people, you know. <laughs> All right. And go to them and see how they treat you. Oh, there's status walls. There's social walls. Every city has this side of town and that side of town. We all have them. And you're judged and the walls are great between the two. There's economic walls. Those who are rich and those who are not. And there's gender walls gender walls. What are the effect of these walls? Well, first of all, if you live within any of these walls, people's lives and their future are controlled by the walls that they live in or excluded by. 
Your whole life is determined and changed. Um, people are defined by their walls. All of a sudden, you're not a human being. You're fill in the category, whatever walls that, or boxes that you're placed within. People are excluded. They can't break through the walls. People live in a climate of fear and all that trails along with it. That's kind of nice down here in Australia. My, my, this is my wife's first time. This is my third time. And I told her before I came down, I said, you know what? You're going to like it down there, honey. She goes, why? I said, the people are friendly. And she was just telling uh, Jess and them in the car, she's amazed that when we were in Sydney in rush hour traffic, or we're trying to get to the airport in the morning, she goes, nobody's honking their horns. Come to, Ca come to California, come to New York and see if anybody honks their horns. And it isn't like, tit -tit, hello. <laughs> no, it's like, rrr, 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 you know, they're honking their horn and challenging you to your life. But fear brings putting people off, anger, frustration, hiding. People are, and this is the worst one to me, people are objectified. People are objectified. They change from being just people to them or those people, which means not us or one of us. I do an experiment many times in the classes I teach, and I'll have two students come up or two people come up, and I was tempted to do it today, but I didn't want to push my luck. Although after the introduction, I should have you come up and do it. But, <clears throat> and I'll set them in chairs facing each other. And this is what I'll tell them to do. I'll tell them, look at each other, and as fast as you can, when I say go, just don't think, just fast as you can, answer what I'm going to say to you. And they'll leak at each other. And I ask them, tell me all the ways you're different. Go. And I have one person do it. And they'll just rattle things off. You know, hair color, gender, size, of a class, what program they're in. Ba -ba 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 Boom. And then, then I'll have the other person say, okay, stop. Now we're going to do something again. You are going to do it this time, the other person. And I tell them just again, as fast as you can, Without stopping to think, tell me all the ways, are you ready? The same, go. And they stare. Well, we go to Loma Linda, um, we, uh, and then they usually about after two answers go, um, I have an eye and they have, oh, they, I have eyes, they have eyes, nose, mouth, I just stop and stop, you're on the body parts. <laughs> you missed it. But the key to this experiment is this, and nine times out of ten it works. It's easier for us to see the differences in each other than the things that are the same. Now here's my question for you. Why? Why? Because somewhere in life, you know, I love children's story. Thank you so much. I love children's story. Kids are just crazy. I love them. They do anything up here. And whoever was the king, he was really enjoying it. Did you see him? Like, he was like, yes, I'm the king. My social status has just risen. Uh, you know, and it's fun. But, but kids, kids don't see a difference. But we do. And it's a part of a fear factor because all of a sudden we learn, like when, when I was young, my, mu my dad would say, son, you're the smartest boy in town. I'm the smartest boy in town. My mom would say, oh, son, you're so handsome. I'm so handsome. And then I went to school. And the first day of school, I thought to myself, I'm the smartest boy in town. I'm so handsome. And some little kid ran up and like, you look, you look ugly. I'm the handsomest boy in town. What are you talking about? <laughs> or you raise your hand and you answer the question wrong. Wrong, the teacher tells you. But wait, I'm the smartest kid in the world. What happened? You know what happened. And slowly we learned out of fear to hide, to cover up, to hide behind walls. This weekend we're learning what Jesus' kingdom is all about. And it is not the usual status quo kingdom. It's the kingdom of rather. On the contrary, 
But we're discovering that it's nothing like anything that we've ever seen and experienced. And let's face it, for many of us, if we've been in church for a long time, if we've, if we've come, all of a sudden church has been customary and comfortable and traditional, and we've tamed Jesus down. We've contained his kingdom. And we read it, and we agree with it, and we know the text, but we don't do it. Because following Jesus can take you to crazy, uncomfortable places and cause you to do things you would never do unless you're truly following him. Today's one of them. Today's one of them. Because how did Jesus feel about walls? Oh, Seventh-day Adventist biblical scholars, people of the word. How did Jesus feel about walls? If I was rolling those dice again, and I guess it's okay to roll dice if they're electrical. I, I, no, you know, I'm just joking. If we were to roll that dice and you had one word to answer that, what one word would you choose for how Jesus felt about walls? Yeah. I'd say hated. Jesus hated walls. In fact, that was his problem. Jesus just went around destroying walls. He was always tearing down walls. That's why everybody was against him. He wouldn't stay put. He wouldn't keep the boundaries fixed where they were supposed to be. He would always end up on the wrong side of the wall with the wrong people at the wrong time, and it drove people crazy. How did he feel about racial walls? He tells the story of the Good Samaritan, most hated by the Jews. He says, you want to know who your neighbor is and who you should love? When the lawyer, when Jesus said, hey, he said, what's the greatest love? Well, what do you say? And the lawyer said, oh, he, he answered his own question. I love that story, by the way. When we have academic degrees, we think we're so brilliant that we love to answer questions. Jesus goes, all right, Jesus, what's the greatest law? And Jesus said, well, what do you think it is? He goes, oh, uh, love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus goes, right. And he goes, oh, I answered the question. He goes, oh, oh, oh who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells a story about the most hated group to the Jewish people, the Samaritans. They hated them worse than anybody. They hated them worse than the Romans, Philistines, anybody. They hated Samaritans. Do you know why they hated Samaritans so much? They were related to them. <laughs> the Samaritans were the Jews that were left in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon came and destroyed it and took everybody away. They were the ones that were left to tend the flocks and keep things from being overgrown in the orchards. But the trouble was all the Jewish girls got taken to Babylon, so they had to get married. So they looked at the local girls and they said, hey, and they got married. And when the Jews came back, they celebrated and said, our brothers and sisters are back. We're going to help you build the temple. And the ones who came back, slaves for 70 years, but... We humans get attitudes. So, you can't. You've married mixed marriages and that. And so they hated each other. I tell you what, family fights are the worst. But yet Jesus points out the Samaritan in the story as the one who showed love. It was so hard that if you remember the end of the story when Jesus said, so who showed love and mercy? Do you remember how the lawyer answered it? Or the, who showed love? He said, the one who showed mercy. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. As a matter of fact, the worst word you could say to a Jewish person is you Samaritan. I don't know if it's like it here, but it's like in America. If you're a boy and another boy goes, your mama, you got to fight. <laughs> it doesn't matter if he's a giant rugby player. You have to fight him. How did Jesus feel about race? The Syrophoenician woman. Where Jesus goes purposefully, and we read from the text that he purposefully went that way, sat by Jacob's well, the disciples go away, and Jesus is sitting there at noon waiting for her. Divine appointment. And this woman, who is hated by the Jews, the Phoenicians, are the descendants of the Philistines. And you know how the Jews and Israel, Philistines got Israelites and Philistines went. And here this woman comes, who, it's a woman, 
She's a foreign woman. She's a woman that's living in a relationship that is less than ideal, where the man won't even marry her, and she's an outcast by her own people that are an outcast by Israel. That's why she's there at noon, and yet Jesus comes for the sole purpose to talk to her, to share the good news of salvation, and as I said last night, in the book of John, she is the first person that Jesus tells, hey, I am the Messiah. Didn't even say it that clear to anybody else. And I could go on, the centurion, on and on and on. Jesus just wouldn't stay in those racial boxes. Mm. How do you feel about sociological walls? Well, <laughs> we know how that goes. I could talk about his followers. Really, did Jesus not read any leadership books or how to build teams? He picked the biggest losers. Who would pick these guys? And think of how they fit together. I mean, we, we love them from the stories, but think who these guys were. Most of them were fishermen. 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 Okay, these guys cursing. It's like sailors today. Fishermen, you know. And then, but then you mix it with a tax collector who everybody hated because they sold out their own people and extorted people. I mean, do you have taxes in Australia? You love paying them? Can you imagine if it was to a foreign dominating nation and some Australian from Perth was charging you? Yeah, that's how they were. So he brings one of those, and guess who's in the mix too? Simon the Zealot. You know what a zealot is? He's, some people called him, a, the Romans called him a terrorist. So you have Simon the terrorist with the people he hated, with a, with a tax collector who everybody hated, with a bunch of fishermen all fighting for power. That's a great team. But Jesus loved it because there's no walls with Jesus. Or Zacchaeus. Or, or how, about, how about the, uh, you know, no, on and on. He always hung with the wrong people. And the, the leaders got mad at him because they said, why, why aren't you just partying with us? Why do you go party with them? And by the way, read who Jesus went to parties with. When Matthew was changed, it says that Matthew got so excited he did the only thing he knew how to do. He called a party with all of his people. And there was tax collectors, sinners, and prostitutes. Now what would happen if your, your pastors, you found out that on Saturday night tonight, they went to a party with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. Boy, I'd like to be at that church board meeting. And what about economical walls? Wealth meant nothing to Jesus. Poverty meant nothing to Jesus. The rich young ruler who all were impressed by, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, get rid of it. He doesn't tell all of us to get rid of our money. He said for him because he realized that was his God. He said, get rid of it and follow me. Jesus gave him an official call to be a disciple. I don't know how that number thing would have worked out because he wanted 12, but he called him. He said, come, follow me. But money meant more. And in the temple, everybody's giving their big gifts, blowing horn. Da, 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 da. Simon Barjona has given 500 shekels of gold. Ah, applause, applause. And Jesus is like, oh, brother. And he looks and he sees a little nobody widow, the least of the least, come and put two pennies in the box. And she tries to scurry away. And she says, whoa, you blow the horn for them. I'm going to blow the horn for her. That's what it's all about. What about gender walls? I know it's a little touchy, you know, in the church right now, but what about gender walls? I mean, because if you're going to follow Jesus, oh, I thought it was still up on the screen. <laughs> if you're going to follow Jesus, then you've got to follow Jesus. It's not follow watching him, it's following living by him. How did Jesus deal with gender walls? Well, let's see. The woman at the well that we talked about. He could have told anybody in Jerusalem. He could have told anybody anywhere. But he picks this woman to proclaim that he is the Messiah that she is talking and looking for. That's me. I'm him. Here I am. And what about the first ordination after the resurrection? When, when they hear a message that when Mary and the women go and see that the tomb is open, that Jesus' body's gone, they run back. They get Peter and, and, and John come running. Peter and John, that's one of the top three. You know, Peter, James, John, Peter, the head of the church. John, 
who I don't, it's not too humble when he says the one Jesus loved. I, when I read the book of John, I go, really, John, that's not too humble of you. But the top three, uh, the top two of the top three, go into the tomb and leave. But Jesus didn't show himself to them. Who did Jesus show himself to? Mary. And even before he had gone to his father. And then he gives the first ordination to preach the gospel of a risen Savior to a woman. He says, go tell him that I'm risen. Well, I got a little political. I may not get lunch today, but okay. I'm just following Jesus. Well, do I have a right to say that? Yes, we'll come back to it. There's three more walls that Jesus broke down, and these are mighty walls. Man, you want to step on landmines and problems? These are the walls Jesus blows up right here. The first one is religious walls. The temple of Jerusalem was made to be a house of prayer for all people. In fact, that was carved on it. A house, my house is to be a house of prayer for all people. The inclusiveness, the cosmos we talked about last night, the world, that Israel was designed and placed where it was by God. The Bible talks about it. Ellen White talks about it. That it was placed strategically so that when people would travel on the trade routes between the great nations of the world and stop there and said, what are you people all about? Look how you're living. Look how your, your society is. And it was to be a place where people could come and be drawn. It had been changed to a place where priests had made it the exclusive club for Israelites only. And basically only Israelite men because the women were on the outside court and the Gentiles. And you had to be healthy and no sickness, no deformity, no physical disability. It was an exclusive club. And only those who kept the ceremonial rules were included and given access. Yet when Jesus came in, and when he does that strange thing he does that we try to clean up and say he wasn't upset, but I don't know how you read it and tell me he wasn't upset. When he braided the cords of the whips, the whip, and he went through the temple, and what was it he proclaimed? He quotes the thing that was on the temple. My house is a house of prayer. For all people. But you have made it a what? Yeah. That's one of the pictures. I, I, I hope the Bible's like all recorded in heaven. You can watch it in surround sound 3D. That's one of the pictures I want to see when he did that. When his, the power of his godness comes forth and they ran. They ran. When Jesus Christ died on the cross... He died at the very hour that the sacrif evening sacrificial lamb was to be offered. And we're told that the lamb got away and ran off. When Jesus was on the cross, and I wish I had time to preach this, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've misunderstood that text all my life. Jesus was singing a hymn on the cross. It's from the book of Psalms. You don't believe me? Go back and look in it. And it talks about the pierced hands, the broken, no broken bones, the pierced side. He is reciting a song just like if I sang a few words to a popular song, you'd know the rest of the song. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. That's not my job. And Jesus is singing a song because everything of the, of the Old Testament, everything of the sacrificial system was fulfilled at that moment. And when Jesus died on the cross, something happened to the temple. Do you remember what it was? The temple curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. I don't know how to change this, so somebody fix it for me. It was nine inches thick felt that could not be ripped but from the top it was ripped from the top to the bottom because now that temple was done the ceremonial things it pointed to were fulfilled in Jesus Christ and now Christ launches into something entirely new but before we get to that I want to say the second giant wall Jesus tore down he tore down the political walls. Jesus managed in his ministry 
to get everybody in political power to hate him. Do you believe me? We think that they killed Jesus Christ back then, that the Romans and everybody, they killed Jesus because he said he was a Messiah. They didn't kill him because he said there was a Messiah. In fact, he wasn't doing anything that a Messiah they thought would do. In fact, do you know when, they, when, when Pilate gave a choice, he tried to save Jesus Christ because he saw he was an innocent man. And so he said, oh, it's a Passover. You're going to have a choice. So here's your choice. You can pick Jesus of Nazareth or you can pick... Now, now think about it. Remember, names have meaning back in ancient times. Do you know what the Hebrew Barabbas means? Let's break it down. Bar means son. Barabbas, 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 son of Abba. Who's Abba? So do you want this son of God, zealot Messiah killing Romans, or do you want this son of God? I don't care. You guys are crawling with sons of God. Which one do you want? The reason they joined together, and if you read the story carefully, to kill Jesus Christ is because the Jews pointed out, the Jews, the Sadducees, where the liberals didn't even believe in miracles of resurrection, the Pharisees, who were very stringent about all, keeping all the laws, the Herodians, who nobody liked, and they, they were from the Greek ruling after Alexander the Great, and, and the Romans. Why did those four groups that hated each other join together to kill Jesus? Because he said, in his kingdom, there's no walls. And without walls, you don't have power. You don't have ins or outs. And they killed Jesus for it. But back to that temple thing. Because we get a little, hey, whoa, what, what? What is the temple? What is the temple according to Jesus? Paul gets it. Here it goes. Galatians 3, 26 through 28. This temple of no walls now. This, this building that isn't a church building where we think buildings are churches. What is the temple? What is the church to Jesus? In Galatians 3.26, Paul grasps and encapsulates that there's no walls. He says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized, how many of you have been baptized here? Raise your hands. Okay. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ to put on Christ, now in this temple, in this kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Greek racial, cultural, free nor slave, social economical differences. There's neither male nor female gender walls, for we are wall one in Christ Jesus. Do you think Paul understood this? Well, how about Peter? Good old Peter. Peter in 1 Peter 2 verses 4, 5, and 9. 1 Peter 2 verses 4, 5, and 9 echoes Paul's understanding. And this is what church is. He says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Now, I don't know if any of you have done building, but I used to do building and, and block, laying block and brick. And you start with a cornerstone, which you true up to everything, the angles and the levels. That's what uh, the whole rest of the building, all the angles, all the things, the rows, are built on that one cornerstone. You don't do that right, the whole building is askew. And so he's saying, oh, temple building. Well, let me talk to you what Brother Paul's talking about. See, the Jesus was what we, we true our angles from, what we set our levels to. That's what directs our life. He's a cornerstone. And then he goes into verse 5. And you, us, are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Wait a minute. Who, what is the temple? Don't miss this. What is the temple? Us. People. He says, you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, are you ready for this? I want you to hold on to your seats because this is going to rock in here when I read what it says here. You are his holy priests. Wait a minute. Oh, I don't like that one. I'm the pastor. That's why I'm up here on the platform and you're sitting quietly looking at me. He says, we're all his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, 
All of you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Verse 9, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest. You are a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you could show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Have mercy. If I had have seen you on the street of Perth yesterday, and said, oh, it's Friday. How, oh, oh, Pastor Terry, how are you doing? Oh, it's good to see you. Hey, where if I asked you, where are you going tomorrow? You would have said what? I'm going to church. Say it again. Everybody say it. Okay, stop. Do you ever think about what you just said? Where are you and where is church? Now, after lunch, because I know many of you won't leave, Avenus, we don't leave good food. But after lunch today, if I said, hey, where are you going? What would you say you're going to do? You're going to go home. In other words, you're going to leave church. So where is church Sunday through Friday? And where are you? Our words belie the facts that we live. Is it any wonder why many of us only live, <laughs> live church in Jesus maybe Friday and Saturday of a week? But according to Paul and Peter, whose church? We are. And it's a church of no walls. It's a church of love joined together by his spirit. Last wall. Jesus tears down. And you know what? If you think any of the ones I said before are bigger, this is the one. Are you ready? Jesus hates the walls that we build around ourselves. We were, tra we were traveling, Jess was showing us all the wonderful places. Swan Valley got me nice and fat. Now I'm trying to hold it in up here, and I just gave up from chocolates and cheeses and all this good stuff, ice cream. I shouldn't talk about food to have in this on the morning. You guys are hungry. But we were talking about our relationship with Marion, and, and tomorrow night I'm going to share my story on Sunday where I came from, but it wasn't a good place in life. It was a place where you're hard and you don't trust anyone. And I was a pretty hard person in those days. In fact, if people said, ooh, you're mean, you're, you're cutthroat, I'd smile and say, thank you. I know I don't look very dangerous now. But. And when I came back and I was back at uh, Loma Linda, now university, uh, no, La Sierra College, now university, we were sitting talking one night in a, a student lounge area, just talking about life. We hadn't even really started dating yet. And, and this, this, this woman looks at me with her gigantic eyes. Women's eyes are dangerous, guys. You can win any argument as long as you don't look in their eyes. And <laughs> that was a free tip. Just, that was a gold nugget I gave you. She looked in my eyes. And she looked into my eyes, if you know what I mean. She goes, you know, I'd really, I really want to get to know you. And I said, oh, baby, I really want to get to know you too. And she goes, no, no, no. And she, looked, she goes, no, no, no. She goes, not like that. She goes, and she looked in my eyes and she goes, I want to get to know the you that's inside there. And I freaked out. You didn't see it on the outside. But inside I went, ah! the little me, the little me that had been hurt so much in life, that it had built all these stone and steel and whatever kind of walls to protect myself. This woman saw through all of it, blew them apart, and saw a little scary me down in there. And I was terrified. You see, what happens is this. We built walls. When Adam and Eve... When Adam and Eve first decided that God could not be trusted, that God really was holding them back from being gods, is what Lucifer told them, and they broke that relationship, what's the first three things that happened? What's the first thing they did? Nope, not hid. The second. What's the first thing they did? Huh? Covered. Good old fig leaves. First of all, they covered. But that wasn't good enough because when they heard God walking in the cool of the day, then they hid. 
And then God goes to him, hey, where are you? He didn't know. Oh, we're hiding. Oh, what are you hiding for? He didn't know. Investigative judgment coming here. He says, well, we're naked. Who told you that? Did you eat the tree? Did you eat of the tree? And of course, as good humans, they owned up to it, right? No, what's the third thing they did? Blame. Oh, God, that woman you made me. Doggone that woman, you know. And then, and then she goes, oh, that snake. And the snake said, oh, I'm out. <laughs> I can't blame anybody. <laughs> but from that time on, we've done the same thing. So we grow up in life, beautiful little children, no walls, no cares. And we teach them. The most painful thing I ever did was to help my children build walls of fear. Honey, you don't go with people there. Why, Daddy? Don't let people touch you there. Why, Daddy? Those, you know what I'm talking about. And slowly, brick by brick, stone by stone, we build our walls until we're trapped inside. And we think we're safe in there, but then it's too late. We realize we're in a prison that we cannot get out of. Jesus hates walls. There is a place in the Bible, though, where Jesus builds walls. Did you know that? It's in the book of Revelation. Come on, Adventist. We It's our book. Now we're going. Now he's preaching. He finally got to the good stuff. Revelation. So, so you know I know my stuff. I'm preaching some Revelation here to close out. And we find a place where Jesus, where God, builds walls. So just listen as I read. If you want to read along, it's Revelation 21. And I'm going to read a whole bunch of verses. I'm not going to tell you how many because you get worried. But listen to this. And, and really, I'd just like you to picture this and see if you can see it in your mind. John says, then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. The old heaven and the old earth have disappeared. And the sea also was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride. Beautiful, dressed for her husband. Come on, Adventists. We get excited about this. This is what we're waiting for. It says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Wow. May you come quickly. And the one sitting on the throne, who's that? Who's sitting on the throne? Yeah, Jesus. Thank you back there. And the one sitting on the throne, Jesus said, look, I'm making everything new. Jesus made it. So Jesus took John and the Spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed him the holy city, Jerusalem. Here it comes. Descending out of heaven from God. What's this new place we live in? It's shown with the glory of God, sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. The city's clear. The city wall, uh, here comes the wall. He built a wall. The city wall was broad and high with 12 gates guarded by 12 angels. Whew, sounds like a secure place, good. I hope, it has, uh, I hope it has motion sensors and everything else. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side. So you're getting it east, north, south, west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Wow. If you want walls, this is the grandma and grandpa of all walls. Huge, powerful, strong gates, angels. But look what the wall is made of. Are you ready? It's made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. What? Who has glass walls? What kind of, what? And then he goes on to say, I saw no temple in this city. There is no temple. It was done at the cross. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, who's the Lamb? Jesus, are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon. For the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is the light. The nations will walk in its light. The kings of the world were in into the city in all their glory. And listen to this. You ready? 
The gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there's no night there. What? What? You have walls that are see-through. You have 12 gates, three on each side, with angels. But the angels are there not to see that the gates are shut, but that they stay open. For, what kind of place is this? What kind of walls are those? They're Jesus' kingdom walls. They are the walls of the rather kingdom, of the contrary kingdom. They are walls not of separation, but of welcome. They are walls not of being closed, but of openness. They are walls of inclusion. They are walls of love. So one final question for you. What are the walls in your life? What is this spirit? What is the heart of Jesus speaking to you right now that are walls in your life? Are there walls of pain? Things people have done to you and said to you that are a lie? Jesus said they're a lie. I love you. You're my child. You're beautiful. Are they walls of race? Are they walls of culture or money? Are they walls of language or accents? Are they walls of gender? Are they walls of fear? What walls are in your life that you need to let Jesus tear down? Let Jesus tear them down and be free. Be free in a kingdom where you actually live happily ever after. One final prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be your name. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.